is let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. So strife would be like arguing, debating, striving amongst each other, right? And what's the purpose why they would be striving? For vain glory. Glory for who, of course? Themselves, right? So let nothing be done for strife, or through strife, I'm sorry, or vain glory, but contrasted with that, it says this, in lowliness of mind. What's that saying? Humility, right? A humble person. Then it says this, it goes on. Let each esteem other better than themselves. So that's very important right there. Notice what it says. It contrasts, again, that nothing should be done in strife and vainglory, through strife and vainglory, right? But it says, contrast that, but with lowliness of mind, talks about being humble, and then it wraps it up with, let each esteem others, right? Other people better than themselves. Speaking about having unity, look at verse number four. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, we as Christians are commanded over and over again and taught by the Bible and Jesus Christ himself, of course, that being our final authority, that we are to love others. That is a, a primary principle in Christianity, isn't it? That we need to love others, and especially, even more so, the brethren. There is a lot of emphasis in the Bible on loving the brethren. Like we see here, this is teaching loving, loving the brethren. But in order to do so, there is consistency in the Bible that we are taught in order to do so, in order to love our brethren sufficiently, adequately, accurately, the way that God wants us to, to be able to truly love our brethren the way that we should, there's something else that we must do at the same time. And that is to deny self. That is to deny ourselves, to put, put aside our own ambitions, our own wills, our own wants, our own desires. In order to love our brethren the right way, we need to deny self. Verse number four, one more time, I want you to look with me. We're going to look at it a little bit more closely. The first statement there, it says this. Look not every man on his own things. So what is that teaching? It's saying we should not be living our lives as Christians where all of our attention is on ourself. Where our eyes and everything that we're doing, our thoughts, our, our focus should not be on ourselves. That's why it uses the word look. Then we, we talk about our focus, right? That's what this is saying. It's saying, look not every man on his own things. So we ourselves as Christians, if you are a biblical Christian, if you believe the Bible, <coughs> excuse me, the Bible tells you as a Christian, you should not be living your life for yourself. Did everyone hear me? That's very important. As a Christian, you should not be living your life for yourself. The Bible says, look not every man on his own things. Then it follows it up with this. This is what you should be doing. So that's what you should not be doing. This is what you should be doing. But every man also on the things of others. So number one, you should not be focusing on yourselves. Now, this is what the majority of people do, isn't it? Isn't this what the world does? That every person is what? They're out for themselves. They're always thinking about how they can do this for themselves or get this for themselves or better their life in this way or maybe you know, get a little bit more happiness in this area or whatever it may be. While the Bible clearly tells you as a Christian, look not every man on his own things. And then it tells you this, that this is what you should be doing. But every man also on the things of others. So as a Christian, we know what we should not be doing. What should we do, be doing? We should be looking at others. We should be looking at our, at our Christian brethren. We should be focused and concerned and interested in other people and not interested in ourselves, not interested in what we want. Look at verse number 3 now. So we read verse number 4. Back up to verse number 3 now. Look at verse number 3 with me. It says this, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. And then again it says this, But in lowliness of mind, this is important, let each esteem other better than themselves. So notice it says that in lowliness of mind, again, that's humility. What should you be doing? This is the mentality that a Christian should have. You should be esteeming in your mind, your mentality should be that you are putting others first. Your mentality should be that you esteem others better than yourself. You should not be living your life and in your mind that you're number one. 
You should be esteeming others better than yourself. This is biblical Christianity. And what this is, these, this is the type of things that, the type of Christianity, the part of Christianity that people don't like living out. Because everybody's out for themselves, of course. Everyone in this world, they're out to please themselves. They're out for their own happiness. They're out for you know, what they want and their own desires and their own wills. And this is one of the major virtues of Christianity that sets it apart from all other religions. You look at all the other religions in the world, the religions are built around man. Good works, the religions are built around man doing better in his own life. Buddhism, for example. What's the purpose of Buddhism? Does anyone know? Exactly. The whole purpose of Buddhism is to reach this nirvana state. Do you know what it is? It's to help better yourself. It's to get yourself out of suffering. So there's no focus on helping others and other people's suffering and things like that. It's for you to escape suffering. Examine every religion. That's what they're all about. They're all about themselves. This is a major principle. A profound teaching that sets Christianity apart from all other religions. That you should not be living your life, Christian, for yourself. You should be living your life for others. And even more so, our emphasis as Christians should be put on other brothers and sisters. We should be putting it on our brethren. And if we desire unity in our church here, if, if Valley Baptist Church is going to have unity and we're all going to get along, do you know how we're going to do that? Where each individual is esteeming others better than themselves. Where each individual is looking out for other people and is concerned for the other people in the church and cares about others and each individual is not just living their lives for themselves. Can you imagine attending a church where every single person is just out for them? The reason why they're coming to church is for them. Just everything that they do is for them. Do you know what you would have? Strife and vainglory. That's what you would have. That's why it mentions right here in verse number 3, let nothing be done through strife and vainglory. Do you know what happens when you put all the attention on yourself? You're just concerned about you. And you know what you think? Well, I need the best for me. I need to make sure that I get the best for me. So then you have a church filled with 50, 60, 70 people, however large, depending on the church, where just every person thinks that they deserve the best. And then they're esteeming their, themselves better than everyone else. And you know what ends up happening? When they don't get the best, then they're angry with the person that did get the best in that situation. They're angry with the person that did get something that they think, hey, I deserve that, right? That's what happens in situations where, hey, I should be the one that's preaching. Hey, I should be the one that's leading the singing. Hey, I should be the one that they're trying to beat AJ out now for, for handing out the bulletins, right? I should be the one that's doing this. I should be doing that. That's the type of attitude that a person will have when they're esteeming themselves better than others. This is very key. This is the second greatest commandment according to the Bible. Number one, you have love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. And number two is loving your neighbor. That's the second greatest commandment. I looked up the last time I preached about this was about 11 months ago. I preached a full sermon about it. So I figured it was about time to preach another sermon on this subject because it is so important. And I'm going to show you that this is taught over and over again, <clears throat> but I want to put a different emphasis on it this time when I teach loving your brethren, loving your neighbor. I want you to realize tonight that in order to love your brethren, in order to love your neighbor, in order to love your Christian, your fellow Christians like you should, what you have to do is get all of the emphasis on your, off of yourself. What you have to do is you have to be, you have to be uh, uh, selfless. You have to actually deny self in order to love your brethren properly. That's why the Bible says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In order for you to be a Christian that is keeping the second greatest commandment that Jesus Christ gave, the way to love your neighbor properly is to deny self. It is to look not on the things of, of yourself. That is going to be the way that you can get to the point where you are loving your brother or loving your neighbor the way that you should. I want you to turn with me now to uh, I want you to turn with me to John chapter number 13 verse number 34. John chapter number 13 verse number 34. <clears throat> I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter number 16 verse number 24. Matthew chapter number 16 verse number 24 it says this, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 
So I want you to notice what Jesus Christ commanded to someone that says, Hey, I want to be a Christian. I want to, you say, hey, I want to be a Christian. Well, Jesus said this. If you want to follow Christ, he said this. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What does he mean, deny himself? You need to put down your own ambitions. You need to put down your own wants, your own wills, your own desires, all the things that you love and that you like, the thinking about yourself, the loving of yourself, all of that you need to set aside. He says, deny self. That's the exact opposite of loving yourself. In order to be a Christian, you know what you need to do? You need to deny self. And then he says this, take up and take up his cross and follow me. So when Jesus taught about being a Christian, this is talking about following him. That's what a Christian is, right? You know, it would be those that follow Christ. What was one of the things he said you had to do in order to do that? To deny self. Now, furthermore, to, to, to go even further with that, Think about this. While Christ was here, one of the things that he did for us was he set an example for us, right? And that is the following of Christ. So we can compare this to the same type of scenario. And how did Christ live his life? Was it for himself? Was Christ going around and just trying to do everything that he wanted and living his life for his own will and his own desires? Of course, he did the exact opposite. What was the purpose why he was here? He was to give his life a ransom for many. The whole, you know... The whole ministry of Christ was to help others. His entire ministry, he's healing, he's teaching, he's preaching, he's feeding what? Other people. He's not spending his time trying to do the things that he wants to do, trying to better himself, trying to just put all of the attention on himself. He's actually doing the exact opposite. He's being uh, uh, selfless is what he's being. And the opposite of being selfish, he's being selfless. And that's why he can say, hey, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to deny, to deny self because why? Because he did that. He denied self, didn't he? While he was living on this earth, he denied self. So that would make perfect sense. And in the context, we didn't read all of this, but in the context of Philippians chapter number 2, after it said, Look not every man on the things of, of himself, but every man also on the things of others. Do you know what the very next verse is? It says this, uh, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So in the context of how to have unity in the church, and it tells you to be selfless and not selfish, to deny self and love your brethren, then it goes on to say, let this mind that I just talked about, being selfless, you know, let this mind be in you, and it says, which was also in Christ Jesus. So that is how Jesus Christ lived his life. He was selfless. He denied self. And what did he do? In order to help other people, you have to set your own life aside, don't you? You have to take time and sacrifice time out of your own day. You have to sacrifice time instead of doing something for yourself and do something for other people. Now, Christ did that perfectly. He lived his entire life denying self. All the time, he was just helping other people. He was living his life, his ministry was based around bettering other people. And that's how we should be at Christians, as Christians. If we here at Value Baptist Church are going to have a strong church and we're going to have great unity and a visitor comes in and they're like, man, those people are just on the same page. There is such great unity at Value Baptist Church. The only way, according to the Bible, that that's going to take place or that's going to happen is that everyone in here becomes selfless is that everyone in here becomes, I believe it's altruistic. Everyone in here is just denying self. It's selfless. It's not caring about yourself, but rather being concerned about each other. That would be the perfect church. If every person in here was just like, hey, I'm just worried about you, I'm worried about you, I'm worried about you, I'm worried about every single person in here, and I would do anything for you, that would be the perfect church you could go to. Because you fall, you got a million people to help you. Right? You have any trouble. Imagine a church where everybody's concerned about themselves. If you're the one, you're only one that's concerned about you and you fall, who's going to lift you up? Not you, because you're down, right? So that's why it's built around everyone else, everyone loving each other and not this self-centered type of attitude, right? So you're there in John chapter number 13. I'm also going to read to you from Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 24 as well. You can stay there in John 13. I'll read to you from Hebrews chapter number 10. Verse number 24, it says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So notice over and over again we see the command 
to consider one another. Not to, you know, it's, it's not about putting the focus on ourselves. What we should be doing is considering one another. We should be thinking about our brethren. We could th be thinking about how can I better my brother. Look at everyone in here and think about, you know, maybe an, an area where someone needs help. Try to help a brother in that area. Try to help a sister in that area. Think, hey, if you have this strength over here, well then, you know, identify somebody that maybe has that problem. Or if you notice that somebody has this issue, don't go to them in a prideful manner. But you should be desiring to help other people in the church. We shouldn't be just reading Hebrews 10.24 and then never putting it into practice. We should be considering one another and we should be provoking one another unto love and good works. You should be provoking each other unto love. You should be provoking each other unto good works. This is Christian character. This, is the, this should be the basis of our church. These should be things that we're actually putting into practice. We're actually using and doing. I want you to look with me here at John chapter number 13. Look with me at verse number 34. Verse number 34, it says this, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Now, I want you to notice it as he says, as I have loved you. How did Christ love his disciples? Number one, of course, he loved them in a great way, but how did he love them? How did he express or show his love? You know, the love of Christ is compared unto the love for a husband, for a wife, and how is that husband su supposed to show that love? It's through being self-sacrificing. Why? Because that's how Christ showed his love to the church. So how did Jesus show his love to his disciples? Through being willing to sacrifice himself. Being willing to deny self. Being willing to set aside you know, himself and get, you know, show his love to his brethren. To think about his brethren instead of himself. So he tells them then, and a lot of people misunderstand this, this commandment. This is not a commandment. I've seen, you know, uh, you know, a bunch of, you know, sodomites hold these signs up. Hey, you know, love one another. You need to love one another. This is not a commandment, number one, to the whole world. Now, there are commandments to talk about, and Brother Rick preached a good sermon about this, loving them with our, which are without. That's biblical too, right? And that doesn't mean you love every single person, by the way, but that's biblical too. But this commandment right here is Jesus is not speaking unto the whole world. The whole world is not gathered together and he's like, love one another. You know, love one another. That's not what's happening. Jesus has his disciples gathered here. And he says to his disciples, love one another. Right? That's like saying this in modern vernacular, love each other. That's what he's saying. This is a specific commandment that is very, very much emphasized in the New Testament by the Lord Jesus Christ for disciples of Christ to love other disciples of Christ, for Christians to love Christians, for brethren to love brethren. So it says this, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. And then he says this, This is the love that we should have for our brethren. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Do you know what type of love that we should have for our brethren? We should have a self-sacrificing type of love. Right? We, we, you know, there's not always the type of situation where you know, I have to lay down my life for Brother Anthony. I'm not going to draw up a scenario where I can die for Brother Anthony, right? But there's other ways where you can, you can be self-sacrificing and you can you know, set your own ambitions, your own wills, your own wants, your own desires aside. S deny self and maybe I can help Brother Anthony. Deny self and I can help Brother Rick or Brother Hall or any of the other people in our church. No, this is the attitude that we should have and we should learn from Christ. We should strive each day to be more like Christ and to keep His commandment. I want you to go now to, uh, just go over to John 15. John chapter number 15, we'll see this same thing talked about again to His disciples. So He's emphasizing this. This is very important. This is talked about all throughout the New Testament in all of Paul's epistles repeatedly spoken of. 1 Corinthians 10.24 says this, Let no man seek his own... But, ev but every man, excuse me, another's wealth. Do you notice that? Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Or welfare is what that, how we would say that. It's not like, hey, I'm just trying to get you know, my brethren rich. When it talks about wealth, it's talking about welfare, your well-being. That would be another way to word that today, right? It's saying that we shouldn't be seeking the good of ourselves. We shouldn't just be looking out for the good of ourselves every day, all day. We're just consumed on making our lives better. But rather, we should be spending our time 
making our brethren, brethren's lives better. We should be looking for opportunity on how I, as a pastor, could better you. Or even I, as a brother, could better my brethren, right? Or you, as brethren, could, be could better your other brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how we should be spending our time. That's how we should be approaching Christianity. It shouldn't be this constant focus on ourselves. Hey, yes, you, know, you need to be keeping the commandments of the Lord, right? You need to be trying to walk in the commandments of the Lord and live a holy life, but your focus in your life should be on your brethren. You should be focusing on betty, bettering your brethren. Look here with me at John chapter number 15. Look at verse number 12. John chapter number 15, verse number 12. It says this, This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Now watch verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So right now he's talking to brethren. Those also called neighbors. And the Bible's talking about loving your neighbor, right? He calls them also here friends. And he says, again, I want you as my disciples, I want you to love each other. He's about to leave, and he leaves this commandment. I want you to love each other as I've loved you. And then he goes even further to explain what type of love he has for them. And he says, greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends. So what type of love is he saying that they should have for each other? A altruistic love, isn't it? It's a, it's a selfless love. A love that denies self, but then loves their brethren. In order to adequately, and in order to sufficiently love your brethren, how Christ wants you to love your brethren, you have to first deny self. You have to deny self, you have to sacrifice things of your own in order to love your brethren. I want you to go with me now to, uh, let's go to 1 Peter chapter number 3. 1 Peter chapter number 3. I'm going to read to you from 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3, verse number 12. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3, verse number 12, And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another. And then here we see loving them which are without. It says this afterwards, And toward all men even as we do toward you. Look with me as I said at 1 Peter chapter number 3. 1 Peter chapter number 3, we're going to look at verse number 8. 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. So another thing that we see here, remember Philippians chapter number 2, what did I say that was the recipe for? It's the recipe for unity, for having unity in the local church. You say, hey, I want to have unity. I want us to have a church where, where we're all of one mind. We have great unity. Everybody gets along greatly. Well, Philippians chapter number 2 tells you how to have unity. What was it? Be selfless and love one another. Well, we see that again here. Did you notice that? 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 8. It says, finally, be ye all of one mind. What's he saying? Be of one mind. He's saying, have unity. Be ye all of one mind. And now I'm going to tell you how to do it. Having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. So how are we going to have unity? We're going to have compassion one of another. We're going to do what? Love as brethren. We're going to focus on each other. We're not going to focus on ourselves. We're going to put the focus on our brethren. I want you to go with me now. We're going to look at a few more scriptures here. Go with me now to uh, 1 John chapter number 4. A lot of these are strongly spoken of and it's a theme, a great theme in the book of John. A lot of the, the authors are given specific revelations like Paul talks about. So they'll focus on specific themes. You know, uh, we see the Lord Jesus Christ being spoken of as the Word of God and the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost <clears throat> also being spoken of a lot in, throughout the, uh, the writings of John. Oftentimes, Another thing that we see throughout the writings of John is this commandment, loving one another. We saw that in the book of John that's recorded when they're out and he, before they go to the Garden of Gethsemane when they're singing that hymn. And then, uh, then we see it in 1 John as well here, which is written by the same, it's the same author. I'm going to read to you now from uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verse number 9. We'll see this again. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. And then it says this, For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. I want you to look with me as I said, 1 John chapter number 4. Let me get there myself. 1 John chapter number 4. Look at verse number 7. 1 John 4 verse 7. It says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. 
And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Verse 8, keep reading. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. That's profound. Verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Verse 10. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now if we look at Romans chapter number 5, it talks about that God loved us even while we were yet enemies. While we were considered enemies with God, God loved us. And God, of course, Jesus Christ, was still willing at that time to die on the cross for us. While we were still yet in our sins, we had done Him wrong. We had broken His commandments, been disobedient. We were all gone out of the way like the Bible talks about. But He was still willing to die for us. He was still willing to be to uh, sacrifice, to be self-sacrificing, right, for us. I want you to keep this in mind as well. If you think about you know, how important this type of attitude is in order to retain unity within the church, in order to adequately love your brethren, I want you to keep this in mind. Imagine uh, you know, a problem arising in the church where one member transgresses against another member. One member does another member wrong. Now that's going to happen because we're all humans. And when a bunch of humans get together, they do each other wrong because we're sinful creatures, right? Now, if every single person in this church was focused upon themselves and obsessed with themselves and thought very highly of themselves, how do people act when one person does them wrong? What's the worst thing in the world? Because they think of themselves like up here, like, how dare you, right? I can't, I can't believe what you've done to me. And then people will just blow up and they're, they're angry, right? And they'll never forgive that person oftentimes because it's just, you know, you know, they think so highly of themselves. It's the worst thing in the world if you've done them wrong, right? That, that's the exact, that is the worst situation in order to try to retain unity. Because the attitude that you have to have in order to be prepared to forgive someone is the attitude of thinking about others and getting the focus off of yourself. Because you know what happens when people, when you're not sitting there and you're, you're not constantly thinking about yourself and, 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 and trying to live your own life as, and, and get the best that you can be, the best you today and all of these types of things, it's not that big of a deal. But when you're obsessed with yourself and you're obsessed with everything going right in your life and you're obsessed with making sure that you're, that you're doing everything right and everything's great, you're going to notice when someone does you wrong, aren't you? Yeah, it's going to stick out like a sore thumb because you're infatuated with how your life is going. You're, you're, you're just focused on trying to live this perfect life and the best that you can do for your life. So when someone does you wrong, you know, in, in that kind of situation, of course, it's going, to be, it's going to seem like it's a huge transgression. And that type of person is never willing to forgive others. Because they, like I said, they, they're, they're so proud. They think, think so highly of themselves. As opposed to the man that's, that's humble lowliness of mind, right? The man that has a humble attitude and he cares about you. He's not worried about you doing him wrong. He's going to be willing to forgive you in the drop of a hat. Hey, don't worry about it, brother. You know, let's just, I, let's just, you know, move past this. Why? Because he's not obsessed with himself. He's not just sitting there and concerned about his life and how everything needs to be perfect in his life. This is the recipe for unity. And if you have a church where everyone is out for themselves, when one member does another member wrong, those two, those two people will never move past that because they're both obsessed with just themselves. That's all they're thinking about. But when you have brethren that care about each other, that care about unity, care about getting along, when one member does the other member wrong, the one man who's been done wrong, if he's not living this life of selfishness, like I said, he's looking out for unity, he's going to be willing to forgive him. He has a humble attitude because he's not just living his life for himself. It's not all about him. It's about, you know, other people. It's about helping other people. Where did I have you turn to now? Did I have you go anywhere or are you still in 1 John 4? Go to 1 John chapter number 3 now. Just go over to 1 John chapter number 3. <clears throat> the answer to true happiness, which that's what we're talking about, about having unity. The answer to true happiness is thinking about other people instead of yourself. When you take all of the attention off of yourself and you start putting it on other people, that's actually what's going to bring you happiness. Do you know why? Because there's a lot of problems in life. 
There's a lot of bad things that happen in life. And if you become obsessed with your own life and just wanting to just, everything needs to be good for you, do you know what's going to be very obvious to you? Like, man, a lot of crappy stuff happens. And then you just become fixated on fixing all of these problems, which they're never going to go away. There are a lot of issues in life. Finances, just all different types of problems. Injuries, like Brother Rick, what he's going through. I went through an injury not too long ago. There are a lot of problems in life and issues in life. And if you become fixated with, with yourself, you become fixated with just trying to reach this level of pure happiness, nirvana, of just no suffering. Do you know what you're going to be? You're going to be an extremely miserable person. That's what you're going to be. Number one. So, number, let me say this actually. Number one, it's unbiblical. The Bible teaches that we need to not, we need to esteem others better than ourselves. We need to not look every man on the things of himself, but every man also on the things of others. Number one, it's unbiblical to try to put yourself first and to seek your own good first when the Bible says to seek others first and their welfare. So, number one, it's unbiblical. Number two, it's causing you to focus on yourself. And that, what that's going to do is that's going to keep you into depression. If you're depressed, if you're unhappy, that's going to put you in depression and it's going to keep you into depression. Because now you're just, now you're depressed because you're depressed. And it's all about you and you're depressed because all of your problems that you have in your life. Then you're going to notice other things that are going to bother you. But not only that, number three, it's going to turn you into a self-absorbed, self self-centered, rotten person. A person that's constantly has their attention on themselves is going to become a very crappy person. They're going, to be, they're going to have terrible character where they're just constantly caring about themselves and then they just don't give a rip about anybody else. They just, everybody else gets the short end of the stick because, hey, I deserve it, right? I'm the best. I'm seeking my own happiness. I'm seeking the best for me. So if you're seeking the best for you, the opposite is true as well. You're not seeking the best for others. Just like it says, hey, if you're going to seek the best for others, you know what you need to not, you need to not do? Seek the best for you. That means you reverse it around. If you are seeking the best for you, you're not seeking the best for others. While the Bible calls Christians to seek the best for others, not to be living your life for yourself. I want you, as I said, did you go to 1 John 3? And just flip over to 1 John chapter number 3. Look with me at verse number 11. 1 John chapter number 3. Look at verse number 11. It says this, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. So notice we hear the, 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 the commandment given over and over and over again to do what? That we need to love our brethren. So a person that is, that is truly happy is going to be a person that is focusing on others instead of, as I said, being infatuated or fixated on themselves and their own lives. And, and Quite frankly, that's, that's the recipe for getting out of depression. If you are having a hard time, if you are depressed, if you are struggling with, you know, uh, not being... Normally people have a reason to be depressed, right? They have something that got them into depression most of the time, right? They have problems. I, I want to explain to you how simple this really is. Now, I understand that it can be hard to um, um, practice, to put into practice, but this is, these are the, the, the instructions to get out of depression. Thinking about these problems is what caused you to be depressed in the first place. So, so take a wild guess what you need to do to get out of the depression. You need to stop focusing on the problems. What does that mean? You're focusing on your own problems in your own life. So if you take the attention off of yourself and you start worrying about other people, you start worrying about other people's happiness and how happy are they? You know what you're going to quickly forget about? All of your own problems. You start actually loving others and striving to help other people have a better life and other people to love each other and you want to bring unity in the church, you're going to stop thinking about all the problems that you have in your life. You're going to get the attention off of yourself and then slowly and, and before you even notice it, you're no longer depressed because you're not sitting there just dwelling in your own problems. You're not sitting there and dwelling on your own, uh, uh, your own issues and whatever it may be in your life. 
I want you to turn with me now to uh, go to Acts chapter number 20, verse number 35. Acts chapter number 20, verse number th 35. Now I'm going to read something to you uh, real quick. Now, this is taken from Psychology Today. Psychologytoday.com. So by the way, just in case you were wondering about this, these people aren't Christians. You know, this is going to be the world, the wisdom of the world, right? Psychology Today, this is mainstream psychology, and they even say that. So I want to read something to you real quick. It says this, very first statement actually, this is the introduction, the first words of this. Popular wisdom tells us that healthy self-esteem is a prerequisite for a relationship. Then it goes on to say this, that without su sufficient self-love, we are not capable of truly loving others. And I've heard this many times, and I'm sure you have as well, that the first thing that you need to do, I've heard it my whole life, that the first thing that you need to do, and what you need to work on in your life is first loving yourself so that you can love others. That's not what the Bible teaches anywhere. That's never taught from Genesis to Revelation. The way to have unity, the commandment that was given from Jesus to his disciples, what's spoken throughout the Bible from beginning to end on what we should do is to love our brethren. Not only love our brethren, for each man to seek that of his brother and not of his own. To every man needs to you know, uh, esteem other better than himself. That's the attitude that a Christian should have. That's why this says popular wisdom. This isn't something that's taken from the Bible. This is something that psychologists and, and, and the wisdom of this world teaches. That you need to love yourself. Now, this is the type of attitude that most people have. And do you know how most people end up? A stinking, prideful, arrogant jerk that's just obsessed with themselves and will burn their neighbor, will burn their friend, will burn their family in a heartbeat. Do you know why? Because they're concerned about themselves. Now, this type of wisdom, the, the end of it, there are these types of self-help people, right? These encouragers, these people that try to get people out of depression. I'll tell you, do you know a, a particular person that went to a church that had a pastor like this? is Donald Trump. I'm not kidding you. Donald Trump had a pastor. I can't remember the guy's name. If anybody else mentions, they can mention it. You know, they can, they can holler it out. But Donald Trump's pastor was, is this super well-known self-help, self-encourager type of... And he went to this church, supposedly. I don't know how regularly. But he, he's name-dropped this guy quite a few times. If you look him up, that's what he thrives on. He thrives on this type of stuff. Now, what's, what is the, literally the biggest problem that Donald Trump has in his life? Pride. Pride. Now, either a prideful man seeks this type of stuff out. You can look at it from either direction. Because a prideful man wants to sit there and have someone tell them how great they are. Hey, love yourself. You're so great. You've done this. You're just a great person. You know, you're, you're so great at these things. That's what a prideful person wants. Just sit there and just tell me how great I am. How, all the great things I've done, right? Right? And, and, and uh, they're, they're, they're told by these people, you know, you need to love yourself. You need to encourage yourself, right? You need to talk to yourself about how great you are, right? Or, the opposite of that is, if you sit in there, or the other side of that would be, that if you sit under this type of, you know, teaching, this type of doctrine, you're going to become that type of person. You're going to become like a Donald Trump. When someone sits there and tells you how great you are, and you're told to sit there and tell yourself how great you are, and how you should love yourself constantly, all day, every day, what type of person do you think you're going to turn into? A humble person? Get real. That's ridiculous. You're going to turn into this self-absorbed you know, self-centered, rotten person. That's what you're going to turn into. If you sit there and just talk, of, talk to yourself. The Bible says this in the first place. Let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth. A stranger and not thine own lips. We shouldn't be sitting there thinking to ourselves how great we are. We should be esteeming others better than ourselves. Of course, we should be reaching out to people and encouraging people. If someone's depressed, you reach out to that person and tell them that you love them, tell them that you care about them. We should find our, our strength in the Lord in the first place. That's where we should find our strength individually. But then we should, it should, we should also have brethren. That's why you need to have a local church of Christians and brothers and sisters to encourage you. A good local church where there is unity, where if you know something happens that other people will reach out to you, and they will encourage you. And not just encourage you in worldly things. Not just tell you how great you are, how beautiful you are. Encourage you in the Lord. Encourage you in something that's meaningful. Not something that's vain. 
You know, not something that's just foolish and, and silly and it means nothing. Real, real serious encouragement, spiritual encouragement, right? That, that, you know, be patient, you know, you know, trust in the Lord, right? Perfect peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall finish. Give them, you know, think, keep, keep walking, look at the life that Job lived. You can give people real encouragement. That is, those people were meant to be an example for us. It says, look at the patience of Job. These people were in samples for us in the New Testament. God wrote those down for us to use and to show our brethren when they're having a hard time. Not some stupid self-help self-love, self-encouraging type stuff. That's not God gave you what you needed in the Bible. God gave you the encouragement that you need. Look at Job. Look at Elijah. Look at the hard times all these people went through. Look at them and look at how God brought them through it and they became a better person. But do you know how they did? It wasn't through their own strength. It wasn't through their own flesh. It was through trusting in the Lord. That's how. It wasn't because somebody told them how great they were every day. That's not what helped them. God is what helped them. Trusting in the Lord is what helped them. Did I have you turn? Yeah, look at Acts chapter number 20, verse number 35. Now the word blessed uh, is very closely related to the word happy. Now, a person that's blessed, a person that's happy. You can see them they're using interchangeable oftentimes in the Old Testament especially. Once you look here at Acts chapter number 20, verse number 35, we'll see this taught again. It says this, I have showed you all things... How that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Notice the consistency here of the philosophy. How he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now that blessing is what? It's obviously not a physical blessing. What is it? It's a spiritual blessing. Of what? Of happiness. That's what that's talking about. What else, what other type of blessing would it be? It would be... The feeling that you get when you help other people. That's what that's talking about. It's more blessed. You know what that means? Do you know who the happy person is in life? The happiest person is the person that's, that's not obsessed with themselves. The person that is denying self. The person that's thinking about other people and is concerned and worried about other people. That's the happiest person. The Bible says it is more blessed to give than to receive. The type of person that's, that's giving... The type of person that's sacrificing for others. The type of person that's living their life and esteeming others better than themselves. That's the humble man. That's the man that actually is living a truly happy life. I want you to turn lastly, the very last passage we're actually going to go to is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 31. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 31. Um... <clears throat> uh, one passage that I've heard people use, um, you know, to try to teach like the love yourself type thing, that you should love yourself, is the, in the second commandment, you know, it tells you to love your neighbor, what? As yourself. So people say, see, like the way that you love yourself, that's the way that you should love your neighbor. Well, number one, that creates a huge giant contradiction. So if you're saying like in the sense of like put yourself first, if that's what you mean by love yourself, well, I can prove that wrong many, many places in the Bible. How you're supposed to esteem others better than yourself. Look not every man on, the things of his, of, on his own things, but every man on the things of others. And then the, the verse like I read in 1 Corinthians 10 that talks about not seeking his own, but seeking others. So we should be living our lives seeking the best for others, right? Well, we're, ex we're actually told what that verse means in Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7, what it means when it says, love your neighbor as yourself. Anybody heard of the golden rule? Right? You've heard people say that before? What is the golden rule? How is it worded? It's actually not said exactly like that. But what is the golden rule? As you want to be treated, basically. In, in, you know, in essence, that's what it says. That's what, that's what Christ meant when he said to love your neighbor as yourself. I'm going to show you that here in Matthew chapter number 7. I believe it's Matthew chapter number 7. Look at verse number... Oh, man. Maybe it's Mark. Oh, I'm in Mark. Is it Matthew 7, 12? Is anybody there right now? Look at Matthew 7, 12. Does that look to be it? Okay, okay. I was in Mark. That's why. I didn't write it down and I thought I knew where it was. Matthew chapter number 7... Verse number 12, notice what it says. Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye 
even so to them. And then he says this. This is the proof that it's speaking of the second commandment. This is the same statement that's used in Galatians when it talks about loving your brethren. It says this. For this is the law and the prophets. You know which commandment the law and the prophets are summarized in? We're told in Romans. We're told in Galatians. Both of them. Love your neighbor as yourself. So you know what it means when it says love your neighbor as yourself? It means the way that you would want to be treated. It's not that you're seeking yourself, everything for yourself, and seeking your own, and loving yourself, and you know, sacrificing you know, other people. You know, it's, I'm, you know, I'm going to be very blunt with this. It is extremely wicked. It is very sinful. Now, I, re I understand people get in certain situations in their lives, but the, you know, this is the type of message that people would need to hear that would help them. It is extremely sinful and extremely wicked when especially a parent starts you know, trying to put themselves first in, in order to sacrifice, and, 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 and by, by so doing, sacrificing things for their children. Where they are actually getting the, their children are getting the short end of the stick while they're getting what's best, right? You know, so I understand that, you know, uh, uh, life is hard. And the life of a husband can be hard, and the life of a mother can be hard. And I understand that moms go through a lot, right? My, my wife was just having a conversation with Michaela the other day, because Michaela was like, you know, uh, uh, why do dads, why do husbands, because Jesse was telling her to do some work, right? Am I right? Is that what you're doing? She had to do some work, and because she's a lazy slob, no, I'm just kidding. She had to do some work, and Michaela responds like, well, why did, why did dads get to just, you know, work, you know, uh, however many hours, and then they get to come home? You know, and then they're off and stuff like that. And Jesse was explaining a few things to him, like, hey, a lot of times they have more of a manual labor type job, you know, and even when daddy comes home, daddy does this, daddy does that. We have our own little jobs at the house. But not only that, I called up like a few minutes after that, and I'm like out of breath and stuff on the phone just a couple of minutes after that. It's like 2.30 on Wednesday or something, and I'm like, yeah, I just sat down and I'm getting ready to eat right now because we've had a super busy morning. And I guess Jessica like looked at Michaela and Jesse's like, she asked her, like, you still want to do what he does? And she's like, no. Not only that, like, think about this, you know. Uh, there, see, there's there differences in jobs. Your jobs may not be like this. But my job, particularly Thursday, this week on Thursday, I started at 7 a.m. And I got off at 1 a.m. I took about a 35-minute break. I do that regularly. You know, I do that because... It's necessary for my family. You know, we're trying to pay off bills. We're trying to, you know, uh, get some things out of the way so that we're able to move and get out of the area we're in for reasons why everyone else is aware of. Uh, some, a recent event that took place. And we want to be able to purchase a home and stuff like that. You know, it would be easy for me to say, hey, my life is too hard. My family's just going to stay here in this, in this area and, and have these other issues in my life, right? Have these other issues. Not only that, your company asks you to work overtime, you should work overtime, right? You should be obedient, you should be a good servant, you should do the best you could do. Not sacrificing spiritual things, but you should do the best you can do. Hey, I understand husbands have it hard, wives have it hard, I get it. You know, I got home at 1 a.m. and I got up at 6.30 a.m. the next day. You think I wanted to do that? I'm not doing that for myself, that's for sure. I'm doing that for my family. Husbands are supposed to have an attitude and, and, and uh, you know, the type of mentality where we sacrifice our, our own self, deny self, for what? For our families, for our wives. Do you know what? Women should, not, women should be doing the same exact thing. They should be putting their children first. That should be the, the primary thing. I understand it's hard. My job's hard too. I get it's difficult. But do you know what? Your children are important. You should love your children and want the best for them and be willing to go through some hard times. Christ is talking about how you should be willing to die for your brethren. Do you see the difficulties that are spoken of here? Look at some of the real hard times that people went through in the Bible. Right? You know, sometimes in order to do the best for someone else, not sometimes, always. If you're going to do the best for someone else, there has to be at least somewhat of a sacrifice. Right? In order to, 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 to you know, help other people, you have to deny self. It has to happen. In order to be a good brother to all of your other Christian friends in here, you can't be a selfish jerk. you got to deny self in order to help them. you got to set aside what you want and help other people. There has to be a level of sacrifice for others. There has to be. Right? And, you know, I understand husbands' jobs are hard, women's jobs are hard. Do you know what we need to do? What's best for other people? What's best for your children? 
Father, what's best for your children? Mother, I get it. I, I, under, I totally understand. Everybody's got their own problems, right? But we, and we shouldn't turn to this, this, if we have issues and we have problems, we shouldn't turn to this, hey, you know, I just need to put myself first. I just need to do this. I just need to do that. This isn't what people want to hear, but do you know what you need to do? And too bad if this offends you. You need to stick it out. You know, I could have just laid in bed and slept the next day too. I could just do whatever I want to do and, and put myself first too. But you know what? Life's hard. And you're called to suffer. You're called unto suffering like the Bible says. You're called unto, you know, sacrificing self. You know what you should do? You should find your strength in the Lord. Amen. That's what you should do. Find your strength in God. Life is hard. Life is hard. That doesn't mean, you know, you, you have these two different routes that you can go down. You can find your strength in the Lord, or you can find your strength in man. Or you could just give up and not do a good job at all. These are your options, right? You, what we need to do is, what is, what is best for other people? What is best for my Christian brethren? What is best for my family? That's what I'm going to do. And I'm not thinking about, what am I going to get out of it? What kind of sacrifices do I have to stop being selfish? I don't care. Because I, you know, personally, and I'm not boasting, I don't think like that. I think, what is best for my kids? Well, I'm going to have to do a lot of, I don't care. I'm going to do what's best for my kids. What's best for my wife? You know, I'm going to do what's best for my wife in whatever situation that is. That's what, that's the attitude that we should have. It, we shouldn't be taking into consideration, you know, what about me? Let each esteem other better than themselves. That's the attitude that you should have. That's the attitude that every person should have. You want to have unity in your family? You need to put other people first. You need to be thinking about them first. You shouldn't be seeking your own, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10. But seek, seek the welfare of others. That's what you should be doing. What's the best thing that I could do for Brother Rick? What's the best thing that I could do for Brother Anthony? Everybody in here, what could I do that's best for you? That's the attitude that we should have as Christians. Hey, it's not easy being a Christian. You know, everybody until, you heard it until the rubber meets the road, right? In every situation, that's how it is. Until things get difficult, until you actually have to start sacrificing something in your life, right? The people are, hey, I'm, I'm in. I'm in until, actually, until things actually do get difficult, until they have to start sacrificing something. Look here, though, at 1 Corinthians, what is it? 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. This is where we should find our strength. So I want to reiterate one thing too. Of course I spoke about the second greatest commandment tonight. But I don't want to overlook the greatest commandment. And what is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy strength, all thy soul, thy mind. You know, different passages are worded differently in parallel. But to love God with everything that we have basically, right? That's the first and the greatest commandment. That's the number one commandment. That's what we should put first. You know what the second is? To love your neighbor. To love your neighbor as, your, as yourself. What does that mean? The way that you want to be treated. That's how you need to love your neighbor. The things that you want him, them to do to you, that's what you need to do to them. That's how you, you need to love your neighbor. You need to have a self-sacrificing type of love. In 1 John, loving your neighbor and loving your brethren, the commandment that, Je that Jesus gave to his disciples, are used interchangeably. So we can see that that loving your neighbor is what kind of love? A self-sacrificing type of love. A love that is, you know, like I said, altruistic. A love that is selfless. That's the kind of love that we should have, right? We should be putting the Lord first is what we should be doing. And all, all glory should go to God for, in every area. We shouldn't be putting ourselves first and trying to seek the best for us. We should be setting ourselves aside, putting God first, and then putting our brethren second. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 31. It says this, That according as it is written, then it goes on, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. So this is a very important subject. It's something that needs from, all, from every church. This needs to be preached behind the pulpit regularly. The importance of loving your brethren. The importance of loving your brethren. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you, dear God, for setting the example and showing us uh, that we need to be selfless, that we need not to be selfish, not putting ourselves forward. Help us not to fall into the world's wisdom, dear God. Help us not to, to, to make selfish de decisions that may harm others other people, may hurt others, but to put others first, not to put ourselves first, not to put all the focus on us and to, and to uh, you know, negate other people and to you know, uh, not think about other people. Dear God, help us to put all of our focus 
on you primarily, but then also on your people. We love you. Be with us. Keep us safe. Keep the other families safe, dear God. And uh, we ask you that you would uh, bless our church. Help us to grow. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. <clears throat>